What is up, people of Blue Valley? Welcome to my Star Girl Season 3, Episode 9 recap, review, and breakdown. I'm a little bit late with this. That's because I was swamped with doing Titan Season 4 breakdown videos. So, just in case you missed those, go check out my Episode 1 breakdown, Episode 2 breakdown. Did two videos yesterday. So, that is why I'm late here. Also, after the news that Star Girl has been cancelled, which I covered in a video the other day, you know, I really just kind of want to take these episodes in. I'm sure a lot of you are the same because this is technically the last we're gonna see of Stargirl, not really including the Doom Patrol and Titans crossover because after all we did get a picture of Breg Bassinger in the Stargirl outfit with Ryan Potter's Beast Boy in his new suit from Titans Season 4. So we have got that to look forward to as well with however the heck that's going to connect. But this episode, this episode, episode 9, was certainly interesting because, you know, that ending, didn't really expect that. And how is that in connection to the person we saw in the robe? Because I'm pretty sure that dude in the robe wasn't a gorilla, but maybe they're getting into the secret society of supervillain stuff. We're going to have to wait and see and talk about that a little bit later. But go ahead and like this video if you do go on to enjoy it. It really helps support my channel, thus it means a lot to me. And maybe consider subscribing if you're enjoying these videos. Videos. I'm sure you're gonna enjoy other videos on the channel, but right at the beginning <laughs> We pick up with Cameron's grandma and grandma icicle is is not a happy lady this episode most certainly not We see her getting annoyed at the artwork again freezing a picture of Courtney We then jump over to Barbara and Pat Pat comes back in and he's still really affected He's uh, you know pretty disturbed by seeing his dad, but mainly mainly the stuff that he learned about Mike in the Shadowlands. And it is interesting. I, I think there is a modicum of meaning to that because we, we do see Mike wanting to do more. But as Barbara said, she does have a good point and a, and a truthful one in that at the end of the day, he's not going to be unwanted to the level of how Pat felt when he was a kid because... Pat has raised him very, very differently. Even though, yes, Mike and Jakeem, Mike mainly is putting himself in danger and having that influence over Jakeem to the point of where they go solo to that farm at the end of the episode and uh, bump into Ultra Humanite. In that conversation between Pat and Barbara, he also went over the history of Mike's mother, Maggie Shaw, and how he's somewhat really thinking maybe he should contact her and maybe reconnect those two since Mike used to ask about her quite a bit. And even though, you know, given the history, Pat rightfully, you know, separated himself from Maggie, times likely have changed and we're going to see that explored. And as soon as we got that teased at the end of last episode, I knew that this storyline would be coming. I just hope that it's not a bunch of drama there, that it's just a hopefully wholesome storyline ahead because considering this is the last season and I know Jeff Johns and Brett Basson just said that they filmed like two endings to this season just in case it did get cancelled it should wrap up with full creative control and in a way that you know wraps up the series in general but it was nice seeing Crusher come into the pit stop a little bit later when Pat was looking her up saying that he is there to talk now meanwhile Sylvester is checking out some leads but really it's just a signal that keeps bouncing all over the place from that of the CCTV that Beth's goggles are tracking and it feels like we haven't seen Sylvester in a while obviously these are episodes where Joel McHale isn't really Really being featured in it. I mean, we did get a voiceover from him. But as you can tell, he obviously wasn't in the filming schedule so much for these recent episodes. Now, Yolanda has completely come around this episode. I kind of feel bad in a way. It's just like it took her going to Courtney's forced to live with her in a way for her to be like, you know what? Yeah, I do support you. I do support you talking to Cameron, maybe telling him everything and having her back at the JSA meeting at school later on. But, you know, ultimately, deep down, Yolanda and, and Courtney are very good friends. And I guess it just took her being chucked out, feeling a bit vulnerable for Courtney to be there for them to somewhat reconnect. So it was nice seeing them get back to where they, they really should be. But this is when we have Cameron's art teacher go visit his grandparents, and that didn't end so well. Grandmama Icicle just, just can't really hack what is going on here. And when she kills him with the Icicle, did you notice, or maybe I'm reading too into this, his eyes kind of went all paint mode, and it reminded me of when he was, you know, all paint blobbed out during that Eclipso sequence last season. And it just kind of made me feel like, is there any kind of like underlying paint blobbiness powers to him? Uh, again, I'm probably reading into this too much, but his eyes definitely did something reminiscent to the effects 
of what happened to him last season when he was all hulking out in paint mode. This is when we get that meeting at the JSA table at school and Courtney reluctantly tells everyone that, yeah, I want to tell Cameron everything about his father and we have Yolanda backing her up. Rick, you know, I actually thought this was quite a cool scene, especially the actor. Um, initially, obviously, he was like, no, we can't tell everyone our secrets because it kind of affects us. And ultimately, though, he said he has their back and he was getting very emotional in that moment. And, and it, it kind of got to me, to be honest, given his home life, his uncle and everything like that. The JSA is very much to his family, which could also contribute to a bit of his rash decisions. Obviously, that can be attributed to the Hourglass this episode, impacting his behavior and whatnot in a bit of roid rage, as I put it. But also, the deep care that he has for his family members in the JSA, so to speak, will likely influence him to act on it that much more out of being a bit overprotective. But he says, don't say I didn't warn you. And it, it would have been maybe okay though, Rick, if, if you didn't just burst in later saying, I warned you. Which reminds me, when Yolanda, Beth and Rick were going around town, we also had Rick like kind of recoil in a bit of pain as he blamed it on just a headache, but Beth knows there's something more up in terms of the hourglass. And that's definitely going to bite him in the ass. We know that. And obviously it impacted his decision to be very rash at the end of this episode. But you have to think that if, if he doesn't sort this out soon, it could have some major health repercussions because, again, his dad put that one-hour limiter in there for a very, very good reason. What's intriguing about this is Beth's goggle says that the signal is coming from the Mark Ents home. And this could just be another signal bounce, like what they've been experiencing already. But I am wondering if the cloak dude at the end of last episode deliberately did this because after all, he was the one who had CCTV on everyone in the houses. Maybe he wants them to go there to cause all of this problem. But at the same time, it's not like he has the CCTV access at this moment. So yeah, we still, <laughs> we still don't know who that hooded figure is. But either way, this is when we have Courtney go to Cameron's. We see the walking stick from the teacher in the trash. Honestly, RIP him. I hope somehow his paint blobby powers saved him and he's just, I don't know, just hanging out in an interdimensional paint blobby land and somehow will manifest again. Not that we'll likely see that, but maybe we would have if we got future Stargirl seasons. And after looking at the snow globes, Cameron reflecting over when his dad went out on a business trip or more like an ISA trip, we have freaking Grandmama Icicle listening. Of course, she freaking listens at this point in time. So I want to tell you about your dad. Cameron's like, I know he was trying to help the world and he got killed for it. But Courtney's like, yeah, this is not exactly what happened. She goes on to say, your father isn't who you think he was. And the grandparents come in saying, that's enough. Rick bursts in. <laughs> it's just like, he is the most impulsive character. It's so conflicting for me because I really like Rick. I really like the actor behind him. But moments like this, I even I, I don't even want to put it wholly down to the hourglass, by the way, because he was like this even before the hourglass got extended to 24-7 time. But in this moment, he just rushes in. There's no like, oh, maybe the signal is bouncing just like it is in other places, so maybe I shouldn't run in. But either way, he does, says, I warned you. Again, I feel a bit of conflicted emotion six. I know he's doing it because he wants to protect Courtney and his family. This is where more or less the shit hits the fan. It almost seems so random at the same time. Cameron must have been like, what is what is going on? Because you know, the grandma come in saying, you will finally die for what you have done. And I have to say, I really enjoyed this fight scene. This is this actually might be my favorite one so far. We had Grandma My Ice School versus Wildcat. We had the grandpapa, who was being a lot more tame, I have to admit, with Beth and you know, Beth, as Yolanda said, fighting isn't her thing. And I do think it was a bit contrived in the writing for her parents to happen to call there. And her parents, albeit, you know, they knew and learned a bit more from Charles McNider about the capabilities of the suit. But again, how convenient, <laughs> right? As she's faced with someone who could kill her, potentially, she learned about it in that moment. So, you know, in the writing wise, convenient. But either way, I love the concept of this. It does make sense with Charles McNider and his uh, brains, his, his technology that is weaved into the suit, that you have this very algorithmic 
Dr. Midnight in of itself come up with this program that's in beta to kind of read the situation, tell her to dodge, tell her to duck, tell her to land a right hook or whatever. That was really, really cool. And again, all of these things are what I love about Stargo and it makes me that much more deeply sad that we're not going to see more seasons of it because I feel like Beth could really get some badass situations in the future like this. I just thought this was like a really cool comic book idea. Rick then goes after Cameron even more. Like we got some really cool scenes here and Cameron was getting his ass kicked at times, but then Cameron in turn would have like a moment where he completely slaps up Rick. And I, you know, everyone probably you watching this was just thinking, this is just not gonna help Courtney. Like he's probably not even gonna hear what she has to say. And this is all unfortunately the way I thought it would go. And I say unfortunately because as awesome as this was, I didn't want this season to go about in a way where it's like, oh, you know, I find out about my father, something like this happens, re, I'm gonna ignore all the actual wrongdoings of my father. But what I will say is, Honestly, given the promo that we're going to get into at the end of this episode as well, you can't blame Cameron initially, and I'm not saying it's unfortunate in the sense of that I still have to wait to see where it goes. It could still go in a way that's unexpected in terms of Cameron might eventually hear Courtney, might not go full on Jordan Mark and Icicle Evil on everyone. It might start initially that way, given the promo of next episode, but the guy's hurting. He's just learned all of this stuff, He's been completely out of the, the light with regards to his father. The person he cares most for in terms of feelings is Courtney had something to do with this. His granddad basically flatlined from a heart attack due to all of this. It's just, this guy is hurting right now. Like, it is organic in that way of thinking. So I'm going to give it a little bit longer in the fallout from this to see what the storyline does rather than just brand it really tropey and predictable. But I'm telling you, the, the grandfather is a G. Like, <laughs> I've always liked him at that moment right before he's going to die. He, he He's like the opposite to his wife. He says, this haste is what killed your father. His anger, his grief, don't let them take control of you, Cameron. Don't ignore love. And he basically flatlines. Now, I didn't expect him to come back, and that might put a bit of goodwill there, even though the JSA Loki caused this in the first place. Beth did resuscitate him, but I thought those might be words to kind of live and die by that Cameron might attach onto, and still might, that his grandfather is a good influence and said, this is what killed your father. Don't let those anger and grief, just like Jordan for his wife, but now Cameron grief for his father, control you. So I do feel like, and I'm hoping, and I'm optimistic that as this season comes to a close, that sure, there might not be a future for Cameron and Courtney, just because even though she didn't kill his father is such a complicated situation. Can you truly be with someone like that? But after all, I suppose Starman's sister did that with Brainwave, despite everything he did. So maybe there is some future in the head canon of the future seasons we'll never see. But yeah, honestly, that was a really badass scene. The choreography was really cool. Again, with Stargirl, my only critique is you can tell when they're blatantly being pulled by like stunt ropes to kind of like swing them up kind of thing. But you know, again, really cool stuff. And Cameron, the actor behind him, must have been so happy for the way this turned out because it made him look really badass, really cool. And, you know, the effects and everything, it was, it was just really, without repeating myself too much more, awesome. And so guys, end of the episode, we have Mike and Jakeem turn up at the farm. We saw like the farm hand there or whatever you want to call him, dead in that little shed. So we have Ultra Humanite likely having killed him or the hooded person. We, and we still don't know who that is. This is when they get the Thunderbolt out as well to use as a bit of a torch. And that's when we hear that grunting or growling again. I don't know if they're trying to trick us with editing or whatever, because that same grunting and growling, we heard, we literally heard in that room with the hooded figure who is fairly slim framed, blatantly not a gorilla. So unless we have to kind of think about it in a way where we had Ultra Humanite in the same room as that hooded figure, I, I don't really know what they're doing there. But that's when he comes out of nowhere, says, I'm going to kill every last one of them. And Mike and Jakeem are like, oh my god. Proper Goonies style scream, get out of there. This was a pretty cool and unexpected end to the episode. Now my only theory behind Ultra Humanite is that maybe, maybe there's some kind of battle in the past with the JSA because he did actually form the secret society of supervillains to battle the Justice League, the JSA, 
and uh, you know try to do it again and again. So maybe he's lost in the past and you know wants some kind of revenge, and, and he's taken out on the kids, the pesky little kids. I really don't know about that. I, I I do kind of expect some kind of you know rundown from Sylvester when Joel McHale comes back on screen, say like, oh yeah. Sounds like Ultra Humanite. We once fought him back in like, you know, 20 years ago, me and Pat. I would expect some kind of dialogue like that. I hope it's not that straightforward, but it wouldn't surprise me if there's some kind of secret society of supervillains cause again, to say it for the millionth time, that person in the robe blatantly wasn't a gorilla. So unless they're adding in this adaptation that he can shapeshift from a normal frame to gorilla, but that's not really how it goes. So essentially Ultra Humanite is a super evil genius guy. His brain is like mega, mega advanced to the point of where he had to transfer it to different bodies and different bodies. And he had to keep doing it up until a point of where he hosted his mind and brain in a gorilla, as you saw in this episode, because the other bodies just couldn't hack his intellect which kind of reminds you of what the thinker does you know he went body hopping as well because the longer he spent in the body that body can hack it uh so that's essentially what happens with ultra human eye but that's also what's making me think that those two individuals the the hooded person and the ultra humanite we saw at the end of this episode aren't the same person because it makes sense as per what we know about this character and what we saw on screen that he just doesn't go to normal form and then gorilla form. And once more, we can't forget about Mr. Bones teasing that he thought maybe we should make a team of our own and considering what Courtney says in the promo. So let's move on to that promo. Courtney says it will take everyone to stop him. And that was after Mike and Jakeem saying, yeah, we, we found a monster in the woods. So I think it's going to take literally everyone, Mr. Bones and, you know, the Helix characters as well. In the promo, Mike and Jakeem seem to get caught in a little trap in the forest. I wonder if they get saved by Sylvester or someone like that. Beth says to Rick that you haven't been acting like yourself, Rick, and you see how battered and bruised he is after the fight. In this moment, he screams out, it was an accident. I don't know what he's referring to, because it's not like when he burst in that that was an accident. So maybe something else happens that he kind of like, you know, roid rages out that scream saying it was an accident. But again, you can clearly tell this anger is all because of the hourglass. Then we have Cameron reflecting on the painting of his father. Courtney tells Cameron that she is so sorry and, you know, what I like about what I'm seeing here in this promo is that Cameron could be like going crazy and he's still somewhat maintaining a bit of his composure, but he's saying, Courtney, who killed my father? And this is probably going to ring back to Mike. Now, I know Mike technically, you know, a lot of people like to have a debate about this. Some people say it was an accident and that's what the show goes for. But like Mike did come charging in with that car. I Icicle's in the middle of the road. You, you would have seen that. I don't really see how there's any other way, but the show's probably gonna be like, oh, you know, Courtney, I can't tell you that it was Mike because I don't want my stepbrother to die and you're probably gonna wanna get some revenge and I've got a feeling it might get to a point where Cameron will learn about it. He might go up literally to Mike's face. Mike is gonna be you know, cowering in fear, you know, rightfully so, and really sorry that I, I didn't mean to do this. And I'd like to think that Cameron, when he has the opportunity to kill him, might even conjure an icicle in that moment, he drops it and he doesn't do it. That would be a nice way to end that story. Just kind of echoing out those lines of what his grandfather said right before he dropped to the floor, kind of realizing not to be like father, like son. So overall, I enjoyed this episode. Looking forward to where things are going. Stargirl this season is being a bit of a slow burner. That's not a bad thing, by the way, but that means and allows for the storyline in combination with the murder mystery to be a very intriguing one. You know, I love this show for its golden age kind of campiness in a way. It brings it to a modern day adaptation that it stays true to that source material in the best ways. You've got freaking Mr. Bones there. That's cooking along the side. I'm sure we'll see him again. The Icicle and Cameron stuff, I feel like they pulled off pretty damn well. This episode had a really cool fight scene in it. Then they subverted expectations with Ultra Humanite and now we're wondering and theorizing what the heck is going on with that. Is there a secret society of supervillains considering his body type doesn't exactly match up to the hooded figure? So I leave the floor open to you now. What are your ideas? What are your theories? What did you think of this episode? What do you think of my thoughts? I love to know. As always, I read every single comment. If you'd like to show support for the channel, you can do so by leaving a thumbs up, maybe subscribing if you enjoy the content that you see here on the channel. We do reviews like this, breakdowns and news updates and all kinds of other things. So do check out my other videos like my Titan stuff. But until next week, guys, thank you so much for watching. I hope you all have a lovely rest of your day and I'll see you people of Blue Valley in the next video. Goodbye.